Shooty, let's go! Welcome back uh, to another episode of What Is It Like to Be Said MOS. I know we've gone over quite a few so far. Um, today we are we are being graciously presented with the presence of a good friend of mine that I actually went to uh, a schoolhouse with up in Quantico for seven months with, my friend uh, Michael Rector. Uh, Michael was a scout sniper in the Marine Corps for a number of years before he went to the dark side like myself. And uh, I figured he could give some perspective and some experience to shed some light on what it's like to be a scout sniper and what it's like to be part of that community. Uh, for anybody that had an interest in it, I'm sure that there's quite a few people out there that would like to know more about what scout snipers do and what it's kind of like to be in a scout sniper platoon or what kind of things they can do for a battalion commander or like what kind of an asset they are to a unit. Um, I believe personally that they've always, uh, they've always been an asset. Obviously sometimes they go away and they come back depending on what kind of things we got going around the world. Um, but Michael, I appreciate you taking the time to, you know, come down here after you got off of work for the day to, uh, I had duty yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And he's also recovering from not sleeping for much, but you're, you know, you have, you got a lot of experience not sleeping. <laughs> so I appreciate you taking no the time to, to sit down and talk with us today. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, we'll, let's start off with, uh, when, when did you first, uh, get into the Marine Corps? So I enlisted in the Marine Corps November of 2010. November 2010? Yeah. Okay. And what was your, what was like the pipeline for you, like going into ITB, getting to the fleet, getting to the point where you were in the scout sniper platoon? You went through like the regular two month course of ITB at the time. Was that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. No, I was ITB uh, West Coast. Okay. I think Alpha Company, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, I know so it was yeah, a while ago. I got up on the shelf. It was cool. Yeah, and you went the 0311, like the regular 0311 package for that. So that was a, an yep. eight-week package. Nine. Nine week? Yeah. Okay, nine week I package. Dug holes. Okay. I dug holes in the ground. <laughs> dug holes for a living. <laughs> uh, so you went through there, and then you went to the fleet. What was your first unit that you got to? So I got to Victor 29, Second mm. Battalion, Ninth Marines. How on a helmet. Yep. Two nine. It's a That's legendary amazing. unit. All the Ninth Marines units are legendary. Both they, they've both been disbanded since then. Just like my previous unit, two three, uh, two nine or Ninth Marines specifically gets activated during a time of war. That's the only time that Ninth Marines ever is activated, right? Yeah, it's kind of like a put it in the glass case, grab a hammer in case of war. Yeah, that but, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I've got a few other buddies that were in Ninth Marines. I know we had had conversations about it in the past. Um, you know when we were roommates um but so you got to ninth marines what do you remember what company you were in when you first got to them mm -hmm. so i checked in it was like middle of may i think it was may 11th may 11th i remember correctly of 2010 2011 2011 mm -hmm. okay. checked in and uh went up checked in with sergeant major because i was a pcs across country yeah as a pfc which was terrifying as a PFC. Yeah. I, uh, I got off the plane at, you know, OAJ, and I knew that I had to check in in my alphas. So yeah. I went into the bathroom, changing my alphas, and I come out of the bathroom in my alphas after getting off the plane. And then I was like, oh, shit, I don't, I don't know what to do now. What time was it? What I need to do now. Uh, it was like late morning. It was like 11, 12, I don't know. Okay, so it was remember. in the morning. I remember the sun was out. Yeah. yeah. So I came out, and... Uh, you know, I'm just kind of looking around, looking all lost, lost PFC. And uh, there's this, this sweet old lady that's driving a cab, and she looks at me, and she's like, oh, honey, you lost? I'm yeah. Like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> she's like, where do you need to go? <laughs> Camp Lejeune. She's like, I'll get you there. I'll get you there. So, nice. she, yeah, she drove me, drove me over and dropped me off. But, uh, yeah, I went in, checked in with Sergeant Major, and he you know, looked at my SRB because we had an actual SRB. Yeah. At that point, it wasn't all digital. It was in hand. You had your service record book. Yep. Yeah. I had my uh, service record book in, in hand, and 
handed it to him and he kind of looked at it. He was like, oh, you got a high PFT, high CFT, you know, you're pretty smart. You got a high GT score, uh, good rifle score. Do you want to go to snipers? Oh, he asked you right when you got there. He did. They oh, were wow. paper screening, which is not the typical route that things go through, but that yeah. was kind of the, the knees of the of the battalion at the time. Right. Uh, they didn't really have time to run a screener. But yeah, they uh, he asked me that, and I was like, yeah, sure. I don't really know. I don't know what that means. Yeah, Sergeant but, uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I saw Major Al go. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and then, um, I'll never forget this, First Sergeant Bradley walked through, walked through the door, like at that moment, and uh, Sergeant Major looked at him, and he was like, hey, First Sergeant, this is, you know, PFC Rector. He's coming down to weapons company. Uh, go ahead and take care of him. And uh, yeah, he walked me downstairs, went to his office. He put French Forge on my uh, on my shoulder, and yeah, that was it. Nice. Yeah. So typically, just so people are aware, what was the typical practice to get into snipers? You would normally go to a regular line company. Yeah. To so start typically, off, right? um, you would go through ITB, and then you. You get to your unit, yeah, um, and then based on the platoon at the time, whatever holes they had, whatever they needed, they would run a screener, okay. um, which is like, you know, various lengths. It, it varied unit to unit. Sure, what was actually in the screener, um, but you, you're evaluated. Yeah, so you try out. It's it's a tryout. It's a tryout. Yeah, it's a tryout to yeah. get into the platoon, and then once you're in the platoon. It's understood that you're going to grow and learn and become more capable, learn the skill set, and then once you're ready, you get sent to the school and you get certified. Yeah, and that's kind of like basically, you know, so you you go to a tryout, you go through the screener to get to become what people refer to as a pig, right? Mm -hmm. What does pig stand for? So a pig is a professionally instructed gunman. Okay, and pig is like, you know, the bottom of the food chain in – the sniper platoon, right? Yeah, well, more or less. No, I wouldn't say the bottom of the food chain. They're just they're the guys that haven't been to the school. Okay, they haven't been to the schoolhouse. They have. They're not, you know, they're not hunters of gunmen. Yeah, they are professionally instructed gunmen. Okay, and then before that, they're slugs. What's a slug? It's a slow, lazy, undisciplined gunman. <laughs> I love that. So, like, all the other 0311s are all slugs. all slugs. You just look at them like they're these they're nasty slugs. little creatures. <laughs> okay, so you basically, they, they, you're a pig when you start off, and then once you graduate the Scout Sniper Basic Course, or at the time the Scout Sniper Basic Course, then you graduate, and then you are henceforth known as a hog, you are. which stands for Hunter of Gunmen. Which is a pretty badass term if you think about it. Like that's a pretty cool tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so you you got into the sniper platoon right out the gate, like right off the rip. Um, what kind of things? What did you expect when you first started off in the platoon? I didn't. didn't I was know. Just, I was just there. Yeah. Wide eyed. Like, what is going on? Yeah. Ready and to then, learn. Yeah. And then you just. You just pick it up. Was there anybody that took you under their wing to a degree when you first got in there? Yeah. I mean, everybody in the platoon that was sticking around, because they have, you know, um, it's a very tight-knit group. Yeah. Um, you're working with eight guys on your team. And then, well, at, and again, this has varied over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the time, we had eight in a team, and then we went down to six. Uh, currently... Uh, I won't even talk about currently. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's tough to say. It's a mess right now. Changes, changes a lot. Yeah, too. it was eight. At, it was eight at the time. Yeah. Um, so you know, you have a vested interest in making sure that one of eight knows what's going on. Yeah. And isn't just you know lost in the sauce, in the distance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fair. Um, I, but I was do- also you know you know you got the playful hazing. Sure. It's like, <laughs> hey, kid. You're the shortest one in the team. Here's a saw. Yeah. He yeah. <laughs> gave him the heaviest <laughs> weapon to carry naturally. Yeah. Like, we're going to make you strong. Your security. <laughs> did you, um, so, did you guys do a lot of classes? Did you do a lot of, like, practice stuff, like, in the Every rear? Day. Every day? Every day. Was it, like, a really full schedule, like, a really arduous training schedule, would you say? Um. Yeah. With caveats, you know, it, it wasn't very strong. I wouldn't say it was very structured. Okay. Um, it was, you know, team leader knew what to teach. Yeah. 
ATL knew how to teach. You know, they they knew what to do, and they just did it. So they structured their own training. It wasn't like the platoon commander, platoon yeah, sergeant. Yeah, I mean, we had like structured training too, but most most of what you learned was white space and on your own. That was okay. a, that was also a big difference between, I think, other. Uh, I wouldn't say all MOSs, but a lot of other MOSs. You know, yeah, you learn what you're taught, um, and the expectation uh, in snipers is you learn what you seek. So if you're sure. not if you're not putting an effort, nobody's gonna waste their time on you. We're just gonna kick you. Yeah, and you're not you're not going through and studying. Okay, I don't care. I'm not going to, you know, pull pull you through and hold your yeah. hand. I'm just going to find somebody who will study. Yeah. Because, you know, there's plenty of people that want, want it in. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's that's one of the things I remember from the my the sniper platoon in my company, because I was in weapons company too. Uh, there was always a certain level of maturity that was expected of the snipers because you it was, it was inherently pre- impressed upon every individual that they were responsible for – becoming better it wasn't anyone else's responsibility to seek out this knowledge and to like like learn how to do stuff that you had to be hungry for it you know what i mean and i always appreciated that about the sniper community because it just like teaches people to be mature adults um and you know teaches a a certain level of independence which is important especially when you're operating in austere conditions uh oftentimes alone and unafraid just you and you know some of the guys in your team or something like that um and so I think the, the the expectation for the maturity level is typically, or at least traditionally, uh, seemed to be higher in the sniper platoon than than a lot of the other platoons who just didn't have an option to necessarily kick you out of it, you yeah. know? Yeah. No, you can't just get rid of a crunchy. Yeah. No. Like, yeah. You, you, need, you can't get, you can't. <laughs> get like, rid oh. of a crunchy. Oh, man, it's Johnson again. Yeah. Johnson. I wish I could get rid of. You. Yeah, but I can't. I I can't. Yeah. Well, so. I know everybody's probably curious, like ghillie suits, mm-hmm. right? Now, it, did you make? Do you were you guys expected Everybody to make your own? own? Mm-hmm. So, and it, again, it varies between unit. Sure, um, but what we did is, whenever we ran a screener, part of the screener was build a ghillie. Okay, um, so not knowing anything about not, it, not you just really got to figure it out. About it, you know, figure it out. Yeah, and ask questions. Hey, I'm here till 17, and I'm going to get whatever I'm doing that day. Yeah, chow or go with my family or whatever. You have until then to ask me questions, and then I'm gone. Wow. And, you know, they'd come up, and they'd ask questions and do stuff. And and during – and a lot of, like, the selection process is less about individual performance. At least it was for me. Yeah. Um, In, like, tangible metrics, it's more about – who is this person? Yeah, and how are they acting? How are they interacting? Um, is this guy somebody who's going to learn, or you know, is this guy just thinking thinks he knows everything? Yeah, and it's just going to be a problem and not teachable. Yeah, and not um, someone who can operate in a team of eight out on our own. Yeah. Yeah, I but yeah, on the, on the ghillie suits specifically, we would we had them make ghillies. Yeah. Now, did you make a ghillie when I did? So, well, let me ask you this: did, How long after you got to the platoon were you expected to have a completed ghillie? From like the time you got there, I don't, I don't know the specifics. I know it was right away. It's it pretty like, soon. Hey, where's your ghillie boot? Yeah. Oh, I gotta make a ghillie. Make a ghillie. <laughs> I better figure this out. Yeah. And, and then, then, I and then I'm sitting there with a needle and thread. Well, not a, not a needle and thread. It's like it was a needle, and I used fishing line. I think it was fishing line. It was okay. Fishing. Yeah, because it was a couple of attempts too of like figuring out. Yeah. Basically, you take a set of camis, and then you you put uh, I cut up a sea bag. Using sea bag on the front, and you like burlap shoot. almost. Uh, no, like the actual, like an actual green. Oh, you just sea cut bag. up a sea bag. I literally cut it in half, and then you put it on the front to like keep your camis from 
collapsing as you're crawling across the ground. It's just reinforcing it. Oh, okay, makes sense. On the front side. Yeah. Um, and the way that you attach it, you can stitch it on, which is the better method, or you can just glue it on with shoe glue, or shoe goo. Oh uh, yeah, shoe goo. Yeah, 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 shoe. Yeah. And most people just kind of shoe goo it on because they're lazy. I was. <laughs> You're I was meticulous. not, I was, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this right. <laughs> I regret that. You probably took, how, God, oh, how long man, did that I, take? I had, I had, I went out and got a thimble, like an actual thimble. In yeah. Because punching a needle through sea bag and camis with fishing line on the back is not easy. Oh my God. So like jamming this through. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. God, I, I can it imagine. It took a it, while. Yeah. I can took, imagine. It took that hours was long... sitting in my in my barracks room, just like trying to stitch this stuff on. Did you ever watch like YouTube videos on it or anything, or did yeah. just like learn from some of your peers and your yeah. seniors and stuff? Kind of ask like, "Hey, how do you do this?" And yeah, like, put the sea bag on the front. Yeah, boot. Were you like? <laughs> did you guys on. use like uh, five fifty cord or anything to hang off of it? Or yeah. Like, so random. I stuff? mean, the whole idea is just to break up the outline of of the body. Okay. Because uh, you know the human. Human body is very distinct. Yeah, and part of you know what you learn is the different V's of the body. And there are five V's. Um, you know, you got your your head, your yeah. underarms, uh, between your legs, you know, on either side. So those are five V's. Oh, you, okay. You gotta break that up yeah. so you kind of blend in. Whenever, so you on the back you make ways to attach vegetation or other things that you know. Like netting and stuff like that, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah, you put netting on. Okay, and then once you've once you've completed your ghillie, is there like another thing you guys do after that before you start oh, yeah. using them? Oh yeah, you got to break it in. You got to break it in. Yeah, you got to break it in. And how does one go about breaking in a ghillie? There's a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, for the most part, you would. Well, you wouldn't if you're the one breaking it in. You're you're not the one that's going out and selecting the sites that you're going to break it in. Oh, okay. <laughs> It would be the chief or your team leader. The chief scout? Yeah, the chief scout or the team leader. Okay. And the and chief scout's not the platoon sergeant though, right? No. So, and again, this is, I assume is probably very similar now. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah. The platoon sergeant could be any O three sixty nine. Okay. It didn't have to be a scout sniper. Yeah. The chief scout plays the role of the... He's the senior sniper and the subject matter expert in all three, all things, O three seventeen. Okay. Um, so I, I was a chief. Um, spent a lot of time talking to commanders, like, "Hey, this is the capability that we offer. Yeah. Um, this is what we can do. This is what we can do for you." Yeah. Do you think oftentimes commanders weren't necessarily aware of how they could use you guys to their yeah, advantage? Yeah, because there wasn't, and there still isn't. Um, at least to my knowledge, there wasn't any professional education okay. for officers in sniper employment outside of um, the employment course, which is was is run at Quantico. Okay, and that is primarily for the ground intel officers who are going to go be the platoon sergeant or platoon commanders. Right. Um, yeah. For the sniper platoons, so you know your typical O three O two goes through IOC, they get a little bit of sniper employment just kind of tangentially, but yeah. it's not, at least at the time, wasn't built into the program. Okay. Um, so it wasn't super in-depth what they were learning. It was just no, like not surface particularly. level. Yeah. And that was kind of the job of the chief to, the chief and, and team leader to advise that company commander, whoever they get attached to, to, hey, this is what we can do. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So he's like the subject matter expert can kind of guide like how the platoon is being utilized by the commander by letting yeah. informing him how they can how they can assist him in achieving whatever mission set or whatever commander's intent. And more importantly, how they're trained. So and how they're trained. Okay. Yeah, how you're conducting the training. Yeah. So how are you getting these guys from O three eleven Crunchy to Pig to School Ready to Hog? Yeah. And. You know, what does that look like? The commanders pretty much gave you full discretion most of the time, would you say? like, Yeah, I mean, it would depend on the commander, but for the most part, for me, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. They're like, I'll, I'll let I, you handle it. I, I trust your opinion on this, yeah. like, and your expertise. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Because, like, it'd be tough if they were, like, kind of butting in and trying to design what you guys are doing when they don't know this. Yeah. They don't know the same level that you, that, as the chief, would know about, like, yeah, and how it's to also It's train. also the interpersonal thing. It's like, how, how have you built that relationship? Yeah. Have you developed a good working relationship with whoever you're working for? Or yeah. Have you kind of just been off on your own, sitting in the corner doing your own thing? Yeah. Or have you been involved in having those conversations? Yeah. So it'd probably be important to be involved in those it's conversations. Very, it's very important. Yeah. And building that relationship. Because if you don't have the conversations, you're just not going to get used. Yeah. And you're just going to sit in the corner. Yeah. And that's not good. No. Yeah. Because then nobody's nobody's learning anything. Nobody's getting the experience, you know. Uh, okay. So you're in 2-9. Mm-hmm. You're you made your ghillie. You're in the platoon. What kind of day to day training stuff would you guys do? Like to like even off the cuff white space stuff. What kind of things were you guys doing to prep guys for school? Uh, well, we would do Kim's games, uh, which is just you know it's a mental exercise. Um, okay, it's probably the easiest one to do because it's just take ten random things. Set them on the ground, cover them up, have everybody come around, look at it. Uh, take the covering away. Yeah. Hey, you got two minutes, go. They look at it for two minutes, and then you cover it back up. You tell them to go away. They do something else for another hour, two hours, three hours, whatever it is. And then at the end of the day, you're like, okay, break out a piece of paper. Kim's game. You have two minutes. And in the in that two minute time, they have to write down as much as they remember. So yeah, like, you always start like, what were the items? Yeah, and then you start to describe the items, and you know, then you start to describe. Okay, these are the items. This is what they look like. This is how they're oriented. Oh my this god! Is, you know, and it's a it's a mental game. Yeah. It's like and you're um, probably like doing a bunch of PT and crazy stuff in between then and that point. Yeah, I mean PT or just normal everyday activities. So like you do that first thing in the morning right before you do your your morning PT. Okay. You just do a Kim's game, uh, and then you go do your morning PT, and you execute the rest of the training plan for the day. You go do, I don't know, rifle maintenance. Yeah. Clean the barracks, clean the CP, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then at the end of the day, you're like, okay, piece of paper. Oh, oh, I would be so screwed. Like, I would not be able to remember oh, man. anything. I think man. there was a paperclip. I, uh, I don't remember. Was that a GI Joe yeah. figure? Or what? Yeah, but it it starts getting you thinking, and it's more about um building, becoming observant. Yeah, and you know, keeping keeping everything up in your head. Yeah, well, and that's then, important. Uh, I mean, part of what you guys do is observe things. Yeah, and take pictures and stuff. The bigger part. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, and we can get to that part down the road, but, yeah, I mean, like, you guys could be, like, technically, like, the eyes and ears of the battalion commander to help him prep the battle space by Mm -hmm. giving him intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know? That's huge. That's a huge benefit. Because, like, the intel guys, yeah, they might be processing stuff like intelligence, but they're not actually out there forward of friendly lines, like, observing it. We would collect and report the information. Yeah. Like, you know, I imagine like- It's actually in the mission statement. It's one of the mission statements? It's in the mission statement. Is it? Okay. Well then, yeah. See, that's like, and like tactical site exploitation, stuff like that. Is that that's a piece of it too, I imagine. Like collecting whatever intelligence yeah. from whatever thing, remembering what you saw when you got there, sending pictures, whatever. Yeah. You know, so that's, that's one of the things that we would do. Yeah. Um, another thing that I would do is I would just, you know, get all my pigs in the line. I'd say, face me. Describe the building behind you, <laughs> and they're facing me, so they can't like see oh. the building. I'm like, tell me about the building. Yeah. How many windows are there? How many floors are there? You know. And they can't turn back right. around. And they can't turn back around. Oh man. And then they're thinking, and it, and it gets them thinking. They're like, how many windows are there? I should probably know that. Like that could be relevant information. Yeah. How many floors are there? Are there three or four? Yeah. There's definitely three. Yeah. There's three. Yeah. Three sergeants. Good job. Good job. Yeah. 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 Three, sorry. Yeah, there are three. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, being perceptive, especially in that, you know, MOS field, you know, probably an invaluable ability. Yeah. I mean, you know. you just got to be able to pay attention. Yeah. Pick out the things that are important. 
Yeah. I always remember guy wearing, you being good at that. As a guy wearing a shiny wristwatch or a plain wristwatch or no wristwatch. Yeah. Is he fat or skinny? You know, what colors are you wearing? Is he wearing? Is he wearing white and black and brown? Or is he wearing like a dingy, dingy all brown? Yeah. You know. Well, that so, that plays into okay. What is what is the baseline here? Um, establishing that baseline. Yeah, like what is the baseline, and then what are the outliers to it, and what do those outliers mean? Because black, white, and brown, or just white and black, specifically in dress, yeah. coupled with being fat in a country that is very poor and can't find a lot to eat, coupled with very nice looking Rolex. Yeah, seven plus three carry the one. Yeah, that's so, information. That's probably, important probably so information. Boss, yeah, yeah, it's probably yeah, probably something important probably that so we should know. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, you know, when you're not doing that on a regular basis or thinking about that kind of thing, it's not something that just naturally occurs to your mind. You know, like especially to your average O three eleven that's just like I'm going to run and shoot things and kick doors in. Like they may not yeah. be paying attention. And that's why that's part of the training. Yeah, is, you know, and those are the, those are just the little things. There are other events that. You know, we would go do sure go and do stalking exercises. Yeah, um, we would, you know, go to the range. Big part. Yeah, big part. So yeah, I know. Now, what kind of, what size calibers were you guys typically shooting? Three hundred eight. Three hundred eight for the most part. No, seven six two. But yeah, seven six two. Mm-hmm. But they were three hundred. Were so for the seven six. I know you had. What is it like? It's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing? Pretty much the same thing. Okay. It's not, but pretty much. Yeah. And all they were all, were, were most of them bolt action rifles? Mm-hmm. Uh, Except so, for the 50, right? Yeah, we had three rifles that we used. Um, we had the M40. When I came in, we were, it was like A3, A5 era. Yeah. Um, so the A3 was um, crowned barrel. It didn't have a suppressor or a muzzle brake on it. Okay. And then the A5 had the break. Okay. And that was the, the M40 A5. Great gun. Great never gun? Should, never should have got rid of it. Great gun. Great gun. <laughs> I loved it. Would you go hunting with that gun, like, outside the ring? No, court? it's heavy. Oh, it's heavy? Yeah, it's heavy. It's too I heavy? I go hunting with it. It's <laughs> heavy. What would you prefer if you if you could go hunting with a long rifle, like a bolt rifle? I don't rifle? know. It depends on what I'm hunting, but... Like deer, elk? Yeah, 3 it's fine. 3 it's fine? Yeah. Probably fine. It's probably... Okay. A little bit too big, but a little bit too big, man, for a deer, man. Yeah. But three oh eight's fine. Okay. Three three oh eight's a great round, just overall. How many grain? How many grain were like the rounds you guys were firing? We shot Sierra Match King, one hundred seventy five grain. Okay. Hollow point, uh, bow tail. Hollow point. Hollow point. Well, yeah, so yeah. That technically, is a match point. Okay. Um, but so it's just like slightly hollow. Yeah. Okay. It's just a, just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. And that, it was more for aerodynamics and okay how it flies. Yeah, you guys getting a lot of math and stuff like that when you're coming into like. You do. Yeah. And math. Yeah, I can't math in public, so math I don't, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not savvy. I did math for Marines, but that doesn't count. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but, uh, okay, so you, how long were you? With the platoon before you guys deployed for your first time, you remember when your what year was your first deployment? It was like December of eleven. December of eleven. Yeah, I was I was in the platoon six or seven months. Six like seven months. May to December, whatever that is, seven months. Okay, were you still a pig at that point? I was. Okay, I had gone to school though and failed. Went to school and failed. That's yeah. that's pretty common though. Most people usually would go a lot of times and fail their first time and have to go back. I didn't say most, but yeah, there a are, lot of people do. A lot of people fail. Yeah, that's like one of the hard part of the problem that we ran into developed. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the reasons. Well, because the standards were just so high for for good reason, you know, because it's like the expectation is also so high. Well, yeah, and there's so I was also an instructor. Yeah, which so, is one of the reasons seeing, why I'm really glad that you the came here. Other way, seeing from the other side, there was a misconception that a school, like, what is the school there to do? Okay, um, I can't make a sniper in 12 weeks. You can't. It takes. It, it takes way way too much time. Yeah. Um, to 
first introduce, like starting from nothing. You can't you can't do it twelve weeks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But starting from a good base, where you've been exposed to these things and you're starting to already you know develop. Hey, I'm gonna pay attention to things all the time. Yeah. Like I'm I'm gonna see how many windows are on that building behind me. Right. Vice. Yeah, they sent me to here to school. Make me a sniper. Like, can't, can't, I can't bring you up to that to that standard in that period of time. In that period of time, yeah. Because right off the bat, you know the way our POI was developed. Right off the bat, can you navigate? Can you get from point A to point B through Camp Lejeune? And that was actually one of the biggest killers. Is land nav yeah especially, especially in camp lejeune yeah, oh my especially god had guys that would come from um pendleton they would come from pendleton yeah and they're not used they to, get, they're not they used to being here, in thick they woods like, they're used to terrain association where's for everything my, where's my mountain <laughs> <laughs> i know there ain't no mountains out here there's all mountains. you see is just you bushes got, you got an intersection right there and there's a creek right there good luck yeah or they're just like freaking out oh well, my god I, then they fail yeah and then they dropped and then somebody's like why are you dropping so many pigs what do you mean they got lost they got lost got lost. lost. <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> do you want me to keep him going because he can't find his way through the woods yeah and yeah. i mean dude like wh- when did the scout sniper program get founded in the marine corps was it from carlos hapcock was he the one that kind of like was spearheading that thing um, partially partially which they were i mean he was in vietnam like he was Thick jungles, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, hey, you gotta know where you're going. You gotta know where you're going. Yeah, I mean, and I, don't get me wrong, I'm not like an expert at land nav. I mean, I pass, I do well at land nav. I'm not like a professional at it by any by any stretch of the imagination. But like, I know uh, everybody always t- said the same thing you're saying that land navigation, especially in Camp Lejeune, was very difficult, very challenging. Yeah. You know, just because like the thickness of everything. I mean, you're going through thick thick trees swamps like vines bramble especially if you're going in the spring or the summertime good luck dude oh, yeah we had a point so when i went through school the second time there was a point and uh if anybody watches this and knows what i'm talking about it was called swamp the point was called swamp the point was called swamp. <laughs> okay. and, yeah it was it was actually over here oh uh, really in davis yeah um it was in like this permanent it's not a lake but it's like we live in a swamp it's a marsh yeah it's a permanent pond lake and there's a little island right in the middle and oh you have to go through center of the island there's a stake and you could see it like you get up you get up around the water you're like yeah there it is there it is i got my point am i willing to swim you know it's like and you had to i mean there's your point what are you gonna do <laughs> yeah i gotta go get the rub so oh it's oh there were rubs yeah, it was all rub course oh which if you guys don't know what rub is you gotta literally put a piece of paper over it and you rub like a what a pencil yeah. or something well, yeah there's so there's a dog tag typically put on the stake yeah and then it's got something written on it at this point yeah at swamp at the current t- it said swamp on <laughs> yeah, it yeah that was swamp point <laughs> yes yeah. and uh and you got to rub it on the piece of paper so that way it shows that you, in fact, were at that point because that's how you got the rub was from being at that point. Yep. Such an effective means of testing to make sure that nobody was cheating. Yeah. You can't beat that. You can't. No. It's impossible. You can't. Infallible. I love it. All right. So, anyway, we'll get to the instructor piece because I am curious about, like, what the, the, the course is like. Um, but so you were a pig for your first deployment with 2-9 – you yeah. guys went to Afghanistan that first deployment mm-hmm. in 2011. Mm-hmm. You said December, mm-hmm. leading into 2012. Yeah, uh, so it was like late June, early July. Late June, I think, okay. When we got back, I remember going. Yeah, it had to be late June because I remember going Fourth of July in Myrtle Beach. Okay, so you were back for Fourth of July. I got okay. that too. Did you guys leave before Christmas or right after Christmas? Before. before okay yeah, yeah it makes sense no we had yeah because i remember merry P- yeah merry christmas <laughs> was written on a sign <laughs> oh really yeah i had post on christmas yeah oh man i was standing post on christmas yeah. in afghanistan mm-hmm. 
That's great. Yeah. Post three. Merry Christmas. Post three. Post Joe three. Yeah. <laughs> so, what was uh, where did you guys go in Afghanistan when you guys are out there uh, during that deployment? We were just north of Marja. That's where the company was based out of. Okay. Cop Duluth. Cop Duluth. Almost like Duluth that. Trading Company. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. And you guys were just doing operations out of there and stuff? Yeah. Um, we were going out to the Bari up north in Anadi Lee and then into Sistani. Okay. And so that was your, your first deployment. It was a combat deployment. You were a pig. Mm-hmm. Um, did you get to – do you feel like you actually used a lot of the skills and skill sets that you developed while you were in the rear for during that first deployment? Yeah. You were forced to use a lot of it based on whatever the mission sets were and stuff? Mm-hmm. Okay. And no, we're using all of it. How how kinetic was that that deployment? Um, Did you say? I mean, I guess it's obvious. Everything's I know, relative. I get. Relative. Yeah, it wasn't terribly. I mean, we got into a couple of good fights, but yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say it was terribly kinetic. Okay, and then I got shot at a few times. Yeah, and then we shot back. We shot times. back. <laughs> we shot back a few times. <laughs> okay, fair enough. They had some. Uh, yeah, some stuff. Yeah. Did you guys go to, you spent some time on Leatherneck while you're out there too at all? No, nah, not on that deployment. What was, that was the other that, base? That, that would you... be my second deployment. We, uh, so we flew into Dwyer. Dwyer, okay. Yeah. We flew into Dwyer and then, uh, I think we, fl- yeah, we flew from Dwyer up to Duluth. Okay. Did you guys ever do anything like? Well, I flew, not the whole company. Okay. Yeah. You guys flew some separate different things. Some of had to drive. Oh. It's terrible. Oh man. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah, nobody wants to drive in Afghanistan. Everyone wants to fly, or at the time, anyway. Yeah. Uh, Did you guys have to do anything where you were, like, off on your own just as a platoon or, like, separated out in teams or anything? Or were you always constantly, like, supporting companies doing things? No, we were off. I was most of the time. Yeah. I mean, it was always... In support of somebody. In support of somebody, okay. Or, but you were, like, desegregated, like, yeah. separated. Um, like, off. maybe one team was with one company, one was with another one, maybe, or something. Yeah, for the most part. Okay. Or we'd be integrated into a patrol. Um, oh, okay. So you'd do some patrols with the 11s and stuff? Yeah. No, if we would go out and patrol, we would just, hey, to shooter spotter. Yeah. You're going with this patrol. Shooter spotter. Okay. Makes sense. And you guys would kind of take turns going out outside the wire and stuff yeah okay did you um what would you say that was like like being you know kind of like separated from the platoon in small contingencies throughout the AO like like so for example when you were out did you were you with like eight dudes or four dudes or six dudes over at like some cop with them and you guys were kind of operating out of some like command outpost or some like Ford operating base or something like that or what or uh, patrol bases were you guys doing like yeah, patrol base stuff did some, um, I mean most of the time it was like my team would get attached to cat platoon okay and then the cat platoon plus us yeah. Um, and other attachments, we would go out and... They could, like, insert you places if they wanted? Yeah, sometimes we did that. We okay. did that. We did that a couple times, and then, like, or we would go up and establish a patrol base or something. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we would we would be there as an attachment. Yeah. So they could insert you, drop you off, leave you, let you do whatever you needed to do there, collect stuff maybe, and then they could come pick you up at another location, maybe a later time that was pre-designated... Um, after you'd been able to achieve whatever mission set you had while you're out there, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's cool. So, you, did you guys did did you guys work with Cat quite frequently while you were over there? Would you say? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, we did a lot of work with the snipers too. Even during my workups, we didn't do any combat deployments, me personally, but we we did a lot of work with with the snipers, like as taxis, <laughs> a lot of times. But it it was cool. I got really close with a lot of the snipers because of that. But um, uh, so. That first deployment, you know, comes and goes. You guys, did, did you go to, uh, what's it called? What was the other big base that was there? Uh, the other air base. 
can't remember the name of it. What's the other big air base that was there that shut down last right before they moved everything back to Kabul? Bagram. Bagram. Did you ever did you go into Bagram that deployment? No. You didn't at all? Um I think we might have done a raid or two. Out of there? No, not out of there. It would have been out of Hanson, but we would have flown. I think we flew up to Bagram once. I don't know. Okay. I was, the, I was the Lance Corporal at the time. Oh, okay. So my, <laughs> oh, you were a Lance the whole time yeah, you're out my, there? my knowledge of what was actually going on yeah. uh, beyond what I could physically see was limited. It was fairly limited. Yeah, so no, I just knew I was in the back of a 53, and we just landed on a runway. So oh, I, you guys I think around? it was, uh, I think we were at Brock Bagram for a couple hours, but we would just stage there and then launch. And then bounce, yeah. Did you guys ever fly on NV-22s out there, or was it all the CH-53s? My first deployment, I think we were just on 53s, my yeah. first deployment. My second one, yeah, we did. I did 22s, 53s, uh, 47s. Okay. A British helicopter. I don't even know what it was. Really? Yeah. It was a British helicopter. I'm nice. on that once. Okay. Did you guys do work with any of, like, the Army while you were on your first deployment, or did you work just strictly with the Marine Corps? Or, like, any, like, inter- uh, like work with other countries during that first deployment? Yeah. Yeah, we had um we had something called the Narcotics Interdiction Unit, N I U at least I think that was their name. Yeah. This is over a decade ago. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like uh they're basically the DEA of okay. Afghanistan. Interesting. So it was Afghan DEA, which were they Afghan dudes? Yeah. Yeah, no. They're Afghans. <laughs> they had Afghan they had... DEA dudes. Yeah, sure. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> is that is that's what she would have called it? I don't know what they did. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's uh, funny. But, yeah, they uh they would pair up with we had I call them LEPs, law and law enforcement professionals. Okay. They were these contractors, um that were paid money to like come advise. Because part of what we were doing is drug interdiction. Okay. Like for the opium and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Opium and heroin. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So sense. we would, and this happened more my second appointment, but first appointment we did a little bit of it. Yeah. Uh, they would do, you know, this is a known, uh, not refining facility, but distributor this is, yeah, this, or something. This is a known facility where they're processing um, heroin and they're processing the opium. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently. And then. Apparently that's like something that got outlawed too by the the guys that took over after we evacuated the country. It was their cash crop. Yeah, I know, and they're like not about it. Apparently, it's their cash crop. Yeah, growing opium. Yeah, growing poppy. Yeah, poppies. I mean, it's the, the region's known for it. Well, I know? mean, when you can make ninety dollars for a bushel of poppy and you can make five dollars for a bushel of wheat. Yeah, and those are. And they're like uh, living, wildly exaggerated numbers. Well, right? yeah, but there's still, I mean, there's like abject poverty over there. So it's yeah, like, yeah, you make a lot more money selling the opium than you can, you know, growing the wheat. Yeah. So that's what most of the people did. Yeah. I heard they grow a lot of other crops out there too, like potatoes and other things yeah. like that, apparently. Yeah. Like it's a pretty big agricultural society. Yeah. From what I hear. Yeah. Okay. So you get through, you get through your first deployment, you come back, and then. Did you go to school during your second workup? There was no workup. Oh, there was no workup. No, I got back in June. Um, I went to school September. I graduated school uh, December, and then we deployed January. Right after. Oh wow! So you just basically came back, went to school, and I then came deployed. back, got a shower, and then left. Yeah. Jesus. How so was no. the was the course it was, it was like twelve weeks at that time still? No. I know you say yeah, it was twelve yeah, weeks. Yeah, it was twelve weeks. Okay. Yeah, the first time I went through school was eight weeks. And then it's eight weeks the first time you Yeah, the through. POI shifts it was it you know, shifted, shifted a lot. Shifted all the time. Yeah. Um, it was eight weeks the first time I went through, twelve weeks the second time. Yeah. Okay. And the second time what was it that you failed? Failed for for the first one, observation, observation yeah. for the ops lanes. Yeah. Okay. And Which, you passed that one the second time. Oh yeah. You, I was like, do I was you going to fail again? Did you feel? Did you feel like that was still the hardest part? No. No. 
What do you think is the was the most challenging part to the Scout Sniper basic course? I mean, if you had to pin it on one like evaluation set, I wouldn't pin it on one evaluation set. I would just pin it on one um, attribute. Okay, of, what would that be of the student? And it's just how much are you willing to put into this? Okay, or and and sometimes this was more prevalent than the. Uh, putting forth effort, yeah, overthinking, because you know sometimes you get behind the gun and they get they get in their own heads and they're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Because I I would give this advice sometimes was just, hey man, we taught you how to do it, yeah, just shoot the gun. You make it sound like it's so easy. It's probably freaking complicated. Just shoot the gun, man. <laughs> get your dope. I, I, I Use told, your spotter. I did that once, and because he, he came up to me, he was like, hey, "So, Arn, you know, I'm not really screwing it over on on UKD, and yeah, you know, what can I do better?" I'm like, "Man, just just shoot the gun." Yeah, you know, you know, you know what you're doing. We taught you what you, what to do. Yeah, you you got the dopes, range, range the target. Yeah, apply the dope, shoot the gun. He's just like. I shoot the gun. I'm like, yeah, just here's here's what you need to do. When you get down and you you know your heart starts racing, you're like, oh, I can't miss, I can't miss, I can't miss. Just do this. Yeah, and then shoot the gun. Take a deep breath. And yeah, the the next day we went out and we shot UKD, and then he comes up to me and he's like, I shot the gun. I'm like, <laughs> shot the gun. He's like, I'm like, yeah, you did, man. Good job. Good bud. job. <laughs> Good job. Just shoot the gun, man. It, you know, it's not. Yeah, you just know what you're doing, and then do it. I could see that. I could see definitely people getting in their own head though, because it's like the pressure's on, you know, because it's so hard to get a school seat. Oftentimes for that, especially if you're coming from a different unit off, not on Camp Lejeune, and if your unit puts you, got you a seat in Camp Lejeune, and you're coming from Hawaii or Pendleton, like the pressure is there. Because if you fail and get sent back, it's like the most embarrassing thing ever. It's demoralizing, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, you get made fun of. Yeah, and just that just sucks, man. And I mean, I never been in a situation, but I saw the looks on guys' faces that came back after having failed, and I felt like well, so that's, terrible for them. Well, that's also like that's what we scream for. Yeah, if they didn't feel like that, they didn't belong in a platoon. Yeah, I suppose like so. If, if they just showed up and were like, yeah, whatever, better luck next time. Yeah. We don't want them. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, they, they got to want it. They got to want it, man. You know? And, I mean, everybody I knew that ever had an opportunity to go wanted it. Because I would, I, you know, I'd spend time reading books yeah. about shooting to get better at shooting and yeah. understanding, like, how do I make this bullet hit that target? Yeah. The first shot. So. Well, and I mean. Putting forth that effort takes a certain individual yeah and that's why we screened yeah well you definitely got to have some like a significant level of drive mm -hmm. to want to do that and also accomplish you know accomplish your goals while you're in that field um especially being as competitive as it is and as as challenging as it is um i also heard that the stock lanes were very difficult yeah as well I mean, it got some dudes yeah yeah I know that uh, I, I know Stalking a few can be hard. Yeah. Like, and that's one of those that if it doesn't click after a while, it's not going to. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. You got to be sneaky. You got to be sneaky. <laughs> I guess so. You got to be, be sneaky, sneaky squirrel, man. Yeah. You know, if you're not sneaky, you're going to get caught. Yeah. I always felt like they did. You guys did such a good job with that. Like just, you know, cover and concealment, camouflage, concealment, all that stuff, man. Like that's a tough that's tough to be good at and good at consistently. Yeah. You know, that is a hard skill to, like, retain, you know, if you're not doing it on a regular basis. Um, what were the – are you allowed to say, like, what the different parts of the course were? Yeah. Like, what are the different things they were being evaluated on while you are at Scout Cyber Basic? Yeah, so uh, when I was an instructor, it was – we had land navigation. Okay. That was, like, the opening – that was the first thing. Yeah, that was the first thing. Oh, you started off with that, so that way you're like, if they can't pass if this, they, they shouldn't yeah. even start everything else. No, if they can't 
find their way from point A to point B. I can't trust them to get from the barracks to the to the classroom. Yeah, fair. That's an exaggeration. Yeah, but. well, yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. But we would start with uh, start with land app, and yeah. then we would move into known distance shooting. Known distance. Known distance. Okay. And how far out were you guys shooting out to? Uh, we would shoot out to a thousand yards. Okay. So you know you're shooting, and the course of fire varies. Sure, it varied. Oh, it's varied over widely. Years, but you shoot out to a thousand yards. You start at the three, and then you work your way back. Okay. Then you can either shoot in different positions. Uh, there was a time when we were shooting all prone. There was a time when we were shooting positional. I don't know what they ended up doing in the last moments, but yeah. Yeah. But they switched it up. It changed frequently. To yeah, be... I mean, not frequently, but it changed over the course of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I when I went through school the first time, we were completely prone and slick. Okay. Uh, when I went through the second time, we were doing we were doing positions in gear. So we okay. had a flat Kevlar on. You had a flat and Kevlar on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was different. Yeah. I think we were positions in gear. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, either way, that shows but, yeah, it's changed. But that's, yeah. that's been part of the changes is like, are they wearing gear? Are they not wearing gear? Yeah. Are they shooting positionally? Are they not shooting positionally? What are the positions going to be for the certain ranges? Yeah. And those are kind of the variations. But yeah, in in the sequence of events, it went land F, known distance shooting. Okay. Uh, what about after known distance shooting? What did you get? Then do? you go into, un, it's like field skills phase. You, you're doing your unknown distance shooting and stalking. Okay. And, and that's kind of like another a, a set, like a section of the course kind of? Yeah. And those are done same time. So it'd be, okay. um, you'd stalk in the morning. Yeah. And you go to the range and you'd shoot in the afternoon. In the afternoon? Yeah. You, so you do your stalk. You come off the stock lane, load in the truck, go over to SR9, yeah, and you're going to shoot on the distance. How early were you guys starting on those days they were stocking? Because I know that people got hot. As soon as the sun comes up. As soon as the, Oh, you wait for the sun to come up? Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, oh was, so it's bright out. Yeah, as soon as, okay, as, yeah. soon as the sun's up, starts coming up, that's when, okay, go. Yeah. You got four hours. And you, they got four hours to get from. Yeah, one I mean, point. it would it would depend on the lane. So okay, it's kind of like a distance thing. Yeah, like. From and you the, got people watching them point. too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, what, what did they have? Just binoculars? They're just able to watch. Yeah. Or? Yeah, you got. Well, yeah. They didn't give you guys thermals to like check for. No. Okay, yeah, I wouldn't think so. That'd be just ridiculous. No. It's just normal. Binos. Yeah. Yeah. Or some other whatever, some, just a regular magnification of some yeah. kind that you could just watch whatever lane they're on. And did you have like, w how many people were going at a time when you're doing that? Would it be just like we had in the class? However many. So were the whole still class left would be going at once. Yeah. Whoever was still left standing, they're stalking. And the instructors were just glassing the whole yeah. time. Okay. Yep. Two guys on a truck, um, and then you know the rest of the, the rest of the instructors would be out. In the field, walking around, walking around as okay. the walkers, because the way it kind of works is, guy on the truck, if he sees something, he calls over on the radio. Yeah. Hey, go check this out. Walks the walker over. Yeah. And then, you know, if he found a pig, it's like pig at your feet. Like, yep. What do you got? <laughs> oh, pig at your feet. Oh yeah. no. And then, it's, yeah, what do you got? And then you'd call out whatever they did wrong. You know, in the hope that he would correct himself yeah and again uh, there's variations on like how the poi developed and changed yeah. over time because there was a point where there was a bunch of practices and then evaluated stocks so if it was a practice stock it'd be like yeah i got him busted him have him turn around run back and then reset you know oh wow so he'd, he'd go back and have a second attempt to come up and try it okay fix himself get a second chance almost yeah. Ooh, a mulligan yeah and then there are others where it's like you had to you had to have a 70 percent average um with two 100s in order to pass okay so it was just like 
how it was evaluated. You were stalking for a hundred meters? No, 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 like seventy points. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You had to have two one hundred point stalks. Oh, gotcha. Over the whole course, hundred points meaning you're able to like get to the end of the stock without being found, basically. Yeah, so okay. you would get up, be able to get into a position, shoot, um, identify the target correctly. Yeah not be identified yourself in your position, shoot again, still not be able to be identified, and then egress. Oh. That would be like your 100 for your stocks. Do you have to, oh, you have to egress all the way back without being Yeah, seen. I mean, it would depend on the day and the instructor standing there, but yes. Oh, yeah. oh that's short, stressful. Short story, yeah. You oh my like, God. All right, break down your position, go back 20 meters, and then head to the truck. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes it would be, you know, Hey, this is stick coming down. This is where he is. And then you point out to the truck and be like, yeah, it looks good, man. Yeah. That's cool. All right. So after stock lanes and UKD, unknown distance, what came after that? Um, then you, well, so those are like the individual skills that are really evaluated. Okay. And that becomes your, your certification really. Okay. Yeah, you're a scout sniper. You know how to do these things. Okay. Um, but more of, and this gets into the actual teaching of the course. Okay. Um, at, at the tail end, we would do comm equipment. Um, you get pretty in-depth with comm? Yeah. Okay. You got to be able to talk. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So you, you do communications, and then you do, uh, you know, pictures. Taking pictures. Okay. Sending pictures. Learn how to use the cameras that are the Marine yeah. Corps uses. And Camera all. and then also a laptop. Uh the G Tax. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you use a laptop in the field and how do you send, send pictures, pictures over a laptop over or... a radio? Yeah. So what uh, yeah. Well, we, yeah, how do we you would send, get into that? Right? How do you send pictures? Yeah. Did you ever take videos too or just pictures? No, no videos. Just, just picture, yeah. Probably had the capability at some points, but I never did. They were really needed to, yeah. They got drones for that. Yeah, yeah, true. Or G Boss yeah, or whatever. G Boss. Or that, whatever that blimp's called. I can't remember. You know the blimp? I can't remember what that's called. They had those in Syria, too. I saw one of them. You could see them from like miles away, and they can see you from miles away, too. <laughs> a random, random story. Yeah. And I don't know if he'll ever see this, but there was a certain lieutenant that was convinced that there was a two man watch in one of those blimps. <laughs> No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. No. And he, uh, in the blimp? Yeah. Bro. He went up to the RCT, like, COC, the, the watcho at the yeah. COC, and reported for his blimp watch. I'm Repor- not going to say it. Reported but... for his <laughs> blimp watch? Yeah. Bro. Yeah, like, there's that, nobody that, in that blimp, a, bro. There's cameras tan- on it, you that's silly thing. It's a gentle story. <laughs> and, sir, if you're listening, it was hilarious. Well, we won't say any names, but yeah, if I hope he hears this and hopefully he's like, Oh, that son of a gun. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so you, you get through pictures and then like pretty much after that you go through a couple other things and then you graduate. Is yeah. That, is that kinda how it goes? Yeah, so and so you do your comm equipment and then your uh your like pictures and mission planning. Yeah. And then you at the tail end is kind of like the culminating events you would do a final exercise okay where you are going out and putting all of this into action okay so you go out conduct observation on this objective tell me what you're seeing tell me x y and z yeah Uh, you get a mission you get an order kick to you kind of oh yeah okay like a five paragraph order yeah do you have to write you have to write orders while you're there too right oh yeah yeah i learned how to write orders i didn't learn how to write orders as an officer. Yeah. I learned how to write orders at Scout Sniper Team Leaders course because they did the weight test. Be like, I oh, know. <laughs> this ain't, order's it too ain't like, hefty enough. <laughs> Dude, I hate that so much about writing orders. It's such a pain. Yeah. Did you have to handwrite them or could you type them? Handwrite them. Handwrite them. Oh, my God. Yeah, you just get cramps. My forearms cramp up just thinking about those. I mean, it was good, though, because you learn the process. Yeah. Yeah. Pain retains. Yeah, but... The, the end would be like their final exercise. They go and do the thing. Yeah, they execute an order. They, you know, achieve whatever commander's intent was provided to them. Yeah, or they fail miserably. 
and they end yeah. up walking a lot. And they end up walking a lot. Did you ever have anybody get dropped on that last event? No. No? No. Okay. By that time, they're, and this gets into like the academics portion and, you know, the, the POI portion. Yeah. The droppable events were pretty much passed at that point. Okay, okay. Because, um, you know, the evaluated portions and what we're actually certifying when you give them the stamp. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Pretty much passed at that point. Do you earn, so... Yeah, a I, hog's I tooth. I can't remember anybody getting dropped. Yeah. At the end. Mm-hmm. So a hog's tooth. Mm-hmm. It exists. It does. Do you have like you don't and you don't have to tell me. Is there like a secret ceremony that you guys would do for those? I don't know. Can't confirm or deny. Makes yeah. sense. Okay. So are you allowed to say what a hog's tooth is? It's just like yeah. a in it's, just a symbol. It's just a projectile on a string. Yeah. So most most snipers probably won't say it, but a hog's tooth is like basically like a hundred and seventy five grain round, right? I think it's probably something like that potentially hanging on a piece of five fifty cord around your neck, and that's like the indicator, at least me visually, like a visual indicator that this guy is a hog or has graduated scout sniper basic, from what I recall. Um, I'm sure there's a secret ceremony. There's a lot of things that snipers do that they don't talk about. That's like very secretive because there's a lot of traditions involved. And rightly so, because uh, it's a small community, and I like I like the secrecy and like the mysteriousness of it. It's kind of cool because it makes people want to do it more, you know. So I always thought that was really cool uh, part about like the just the you know the hidden traditions and uh, unspoken traditions and stuff that the sniper community has. Um, so y- you get through, you got through your, your scout cyber basic, you deployed for your second deployment. How was your second deployment in comparison with your first one? You said it was a little bit, it was way more fun, way more fun. You had a lot more work. Where, what regions did you guys go to for the second one? We were all over the place. Yeah. So we were out of Leatherneck. Out of Leatherneck. And we were doing raids. Raids. Helo raids? Yep. Okay. That was probably as a, a lot of work. Not for me, really. I mean, I was the sniper team leader. We would get tasked, hey, this is the next raid coming up. You'd prep okay. for it. Did you write orders while you're out there, too? Or Yeah, I mean, not not full-blown ones. It would yeah. just be, hey, brag my team. Like, hey, this is what we're about to go do. This is the imagery. Yeah, it'll be here, here, and here. This is what we're looking for. This is the target. Yeah. Um, they're going to be you know, doing their shit in here, and we're watching out. Yeah. Took a lot of pictures, probably. No? No. Okay. Not Got to that. do cooler stuff. Yeah, no. If we were if we were there as, I mean, security with a long gun. Okay, so kind of like Guardian Angel type stuff? Okay, that makes sense. I know you said you guys even worked with, like, armored vehicles too, right? Like, Or not armored vehicles, but, like, tanks. Like, you had some experience around tanks. Yeah, right just, the, just the one time. There was, uh, was that on your second deployment? Yeah. What was that? Where was that tank unit out of? Were they from Pendleton or? I, mean, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. And uh, it was R.I.P. Tanks. Yeah. It was Sh- Shurike. I think the uh, the cop was called Shurike. Shurike. Yeah. It was. Um. I don't know. There was there was a unit that got ringed in with a bunch of IEDs. Okay. It was north of Leatherneck, north of uh, Lashkarga. Lashkarga? Yeah. Okay. Uh, up in Goreshk. I think it was Goreshk. Those names are just like, where Where do you think all these names originated for all these places in Afghanistan? They're so like ancient sounding. Sounds like something from Alexander the Great's time, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Persian? Maybe Persian. Yeah, that probably is probably. That probably yeah, I mean, I guess they're given their proximity to Iran, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just crazy names, but um, so you had a lot of you had a lot of stuff going on, doing a lot of helo raids your second time. How was it being um, a team leader in that deployment? As opposed, were you a corporal at the time? I was. Okay, so you were a corporal team leader at that time instead of a lance corporal pig. Would you say that was a significant difference, like a big difference for you? Yeah. 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 You had a lot more authority, a lot more like, hey, a this is kind of responsibility. A lot more responsibility. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, how many guys were you in your team at that time? A 
Well, I got to count on that. Yeah, you gotta remember, yeah. <laughs> I know it's years ago. What year is this? There you go. Four, 13. 13? Seven guys, so eight with me. Eight, including you, okay. Yeah, be eight. And did you guys split up a lot to go to different locations, or were you usually all together? Um, uh, we would split mostly. Split, yeah, yeah. The way we were kind of doing it, we just kind of split up into groups, and we'd pair up with a machine gun team. Okay. And a machine gun and a bolt gun, pretty lethal. Yeah. Yeah, machine gun and a bolt gun. You got suppression and you got you can reach out and touch deep targets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty effective uh, means of countering any type of enemy assault. Put a jab with it. Oh, then you're like set. Then you can counter we, enemy vehicles. A couple of the raids. Yeah. Did you? See, so you some fifty twos out there with you. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah, that's a pretty. I mean, regardless of the commander's intent, you can achieve quite a few different types of mission sets when you have that many variations or that much of a variety an individual right there okay so that one was that another six or seven month or probably that was a short one short one um yeah i think it was like four or five months yeah i think we got there in january and then we left in april was it cold in january when you got there yeah chilly i think we got there in january and left in may you know what's funny I heard Marsoc had their own pool at Leatherneck, like a swimming pool with the Marsoc emblem their in it. Own pool? I don't. I don't know. Can't confirm. That. Somebody told me. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody don't know. told there, me they had a swimming pool there. Yeah, I don't know. There was a pool party while I was there at Bastion. There was a One pool day. party. Yeah, they they got like um, <laughs> that's it was like an above ground pool. Oh really? Had. Yeah, and they filled it up, and then they had like this pool party. Dude, I heard there was an in-ground pool. Oh, Bastion was... Leatherneck Bastion was wild. Yeah. It was, just, was, it was it all Marines unreal. there? Unreal. Was it only uh, Marines? No. no. Oh, it was like it was a coalition big, joint? Yeah, big coalition base. Well, okay. Bastion was more the coalition base. Leatherneck was the Marine base portion of it. Oh, they're Bastion like, was the whole, was like the whole actual base. Well, Leatherneck was no, just a camp on the base? They're two separate things, but they're like right next to each other. They're joined. Okay. So and there's like different camps on different yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's kind of how it was where I was at when I was in Iraq too. Same similar thing. You have like tons of different camps owned by different parties for whatever reason, and like they're all in one large enclosed space. You know. Um, all right. So you you get through that that deployment. You come back. Did you go straight to the schoolhouse to be an instructor at that point, or did you go to ITB to be like a regular combat instructor? Oh, I stayed. I stayed with. Uh... Stay with two nine. Okay. So I was there from eleven until we rolled the colors in April of fifteen. No kidding. Yeah, I was actually me and my buddy were like one of five five Marines left in two nine past rolling the colors. And you just went to the regiment at that point? No. I just stayed in the company office because <laughs> this is this is like the, yeah, well this is doing kind here? of the funny part. There was a there was a warrant officer, um <coughs> and a master guns. Our master arm, I can't remember. Like two of them. And then me and my buddy. Yeah. And they're just like looking at us like, what are you guys still doing here? You know? We we know why we're here, but yeah. why are you guys here? I don't know. I haven't got orders. The monitor just forgot about us. Because we <laughs> called him. It was like a month after we rolled the colors. Yeah, we called him. And, oh, yeah. Oh, crap. Sorry, dude. <laughs> I'll get you orders. Right, I got you orders. And then he had us orders like the next week. And Where did you go from there? I went to 8th Reg. Eighth reg, okay, all right, and then you were eighth reg for I was eighth reg for I don't know three or four months, and then I went over to SOI as an instructor. At That's ITB. right, and you went to ITB, and you were just like teaching elevens at first. Yep. Okay, and then you did you did the combat instructor thing for the elevens for a little bit. Where did you go after that? So, I was uh, with Charlie Company ITB for two. Cycles or three cycles, two or three cycles. I can't, I can't remember. Yeah, and then I went to uh, AITB. AITB, and that's when you that's when you got to AITB. Yeah, okay, that's when you went to the Scout Center Basic Course. And and how long were you an instructor over there for? 
I got there in like 16. It was like June of 16. Yeah. And then I left in May of 18. Okay. So two years. About two years, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And would you would you consider that a pretty rewarding experience to oh, be yeah. like a, a pivotal, integral part of like the formative years of oh, yeah. snipers? Uh, of, of snipers, I don't know, but of, of my career and my life, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, being an instructor there, I'll never have an experience like that again. Yeah. yeah. One of the guys that I was there with, uh, you know, it's like lightning never strikes twice. Yeah. It was, it was a great time. And are you still pretty close friends with a lot of your instructor buddies, peers that you were with there? I mean, I talk to him periodically. Yeah. Is he still in or did he get out? In, in touch. He He's recently retired. Recently retired? Recently retired. God bless him. How long would, How long had he, be, had he been in for? 20. 20? Yeah. Were you a staff sergeant by the time you got there? I was a sergeant. Sergeant still? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's pretty. That's a pretty big deal, being a sergeant that gets selected to go to AITB, isn't it? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say a big deal. There were plenty of sergeants that go in over. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I always think to myself, like most of so. Most of the instructors over there would be staff. Yeah. Um, there weren't a lot of sergeants, but it yeah. wasn't unheard of. I think that that must the be advanced courses, like yeah, uh, advanced machine guns, advanced mortars. They had more sergeants really because it's yeah because the course is tailored for you know the corporal um okay even but, though lance corporals do go sometimes yeah yeah, yeah no lance corporals go, but yeah yeah it's it's tailored for them um whereas the the more advanced courses um are tailored for a, a different populations audience. population yeah 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 makes sense. population yeah, kind of like how IULC is tailored towards like the staff and COs, you know, um, typically staff sergeants. Uh, so, did you did you make any significant changes over there with the POI once you got to AITB to teach like me personally? Yeah, did you like have any impact on the POI? Um, no. Kind of stayed the same for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. But you enjoyed your time over there. I loved it. Yeah. Did you, were, were there long hours? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you're up with the students the whole time that they're up kind of thing? or No. Oh, you're not? I was with the privates. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's different. Now, at sniper school, it's like, hey, pig, be here at eight. And you have all these things yeah. you have to do before you're here at eight, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And then you're like, I'm going home to my wife. Yeah. Like, <laughs> hey, pig, be here at eight. We're leaving at whatever time. Yeah. You know, there there was other stuff that we had to do, but yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not babysitting corporals. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. But you you enjoyed it. You you stayed there for a couple years, and then you got selected for the MESEP program where you're there. Went off to college, and that's kind of like after I'm after you commissioned, then that's when I kind of met you. Yep. Yeah. Well, I know your MOS is different now. Obviously, like after you commissioned, it changed. But quality um, spread's real. Yeah, the quality spread. <laughs> the quality spread is real, folks. Um, but that I know that part of your life and that piece of your life will always be, you know, a very important part of your personality and like uh, an important. You know, it had a huge impact on who you are as a person. Like developmentally, because you, how old were you when you got to uh, to the fleet? Nineteen. Nineteen years old. Yeah. Yeah. So that like you matured through, like your brain finished developing after you were like a sergeant, and you were like, you know, you kind of grew up in the Marine Corps to a degree, like a lot of eighteen year olds do, you know. Um, so I imagine that that had a huge impact on who you turned out to be. Do you feel like you got into reading more because of the snipers? Because, like, just, like, the way that the kind of community is in general. I know you like to read a yeah, lot. Yeah, I wouldn't say more. That's just kind of my personality. Yeah. But Did you already read before you joined the Marine Corps? Yeah. Were you into reading? Okay. Yeah. I, I read. Still read. Still read. I know how to read. Uh, <laughs> I know you know how to read. I, I can read. 
<laughs> you, you know how to read probably better than I do, honestly. I can read letters. He told me I needed to read Starship Troopers. I still haven't done it yet because I haven't made enough time for it, but I, I plan to. I haven't forgotten. That's a great I haven't book. forgotten. That's a great By book. the way, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to read Starship Troopers, it is on the Commandant's reading list, and you know, if, if he's recommending reading it, then it's probably worth your time. So, um, Anyway, uh, hopefully... Hopefully this provides a little bit of perspective for anybody that's interested in what it was that snipers do. Obviously now snipers don't have a schoolhouse anymore. The last sniper school still graduated. School house. It did? Yeah. Schoolhouse still exists. Okay. As far as I know. But there's no scout sniper basic course. There are no basic courses running. Yeah. The MOS is not being produced. Yeah. I don't know if advanced and team leaders course or the advanced courses are still running or not. Yeah. I assume they still are because there are 0317s out there. Yeah. I think the last class out of here was like last December. Yeah, that's what I heard. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. But personally, me personally, I think it'll be back. It's right. just a matter of when. You yeah. know what I mean? I think that it'll more come than that, because you always, they always come back. There's always going to be a need yeah. when the need arises to shoot somebody in the face. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be back. It's just a matter of when. And when that happens, watch this video and learn a little bit about what it means and what you what kind of things to prepare for if you don't have like necessarily uh a lot of people telling you about those types of things but um again i i appreciate your time uh being willing to come here in your off time to provide some of your experiences and perspectives and um obviously you've had a very interesting career uh anybody i know that was willing to dedicate time to being in the sniper community uh didn't do it willy-nilly or just like because somebody told them to is because like you wanted it like you dedicated an enormous amount of time to perfect that craft and also become an instructor so you were like immersed in the knowledge and learning about it and being even better at the profession and teaching people all the time um and create and like making hogs like you helped personally make hogs you know, and that's that's pretty cool. Um, not a lot of people can say that, especially now since they're not even running courses anymore. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. I think that there's a lot of people out there in the community that will appreciate this from the O three seventeen community. And for anybody that doesn't know what an O three seventeen is, or what a scout sniper in the Marine Corps is, or what it's like being one, or what the training pipeline is like, hopefully you'll learn something from this video. Um, and yeah. So anyway, again, I appreciate your time and appreciate you coming out here uh, in your off time. And, and it's good to see you. I'm glad your, your mustache is coming in real thick, oh, real thanks. good. You've been taking good care of it. I try. I wax it. You wax it? <laughs> wax it. Man. Don't wax it. Just wax it, man. But uh, anyway, we'll see you in the next video. And uh, yeah, take it easy.